thank God for being before you once again. We certainly thank God for how you have blessed us and kept us all, and we give him the praise and the glory for that. And we thank God for you that, that are viewing this telecast, <laughs> this broadcast. Amen. We, uh, we want you to uh, go ahead and get your little thin paper in a position on your communion that where you'll be able, be able to commune with us at the end of this broadcast, we'll be having communion. And I, we want to do it together. So go ahead and get your little paper, that top paper off that, that uh, little wafer uh, so we can uh, commune together. Amen. We certainly, certainly thank God for everything. And at this time, we want to have a prayer. Eternal and everlasting Father, we come once again and say thank you. We thank you, dear God, for blessing us to come before your people once again. We thank you, God, for what all you have done for us and for each and every one, God, that holds up the bloodstained banner of Jesus Christ. And God, we will continue to pray for those that don't know you in the pardon of their sins. We ask that you help them to know you. We pray, Father God, that you will continue to bless all of us, God, to come back together one day soon. And Lord, we miss the saints. Praise the Lord. But we know since we are the church, amen, we can still have church every day. Praise the Lord, somebody. Why? Because we are the church. We do pray for each and every one that are sick. We pray for those that, uh, that uh, are not well. We ask that you continue to look to God. We pray for your healing, but we ask that you pray as well. Much prayer, much power, little prayer, little power. And Lord, we thank you for it. We give you the praise and the glory. And we ask you all these blessings in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Our message today is coming from the ninth chapter of Acts. The ninth chapter of Acts. We're going to begin reading at the first verse, and we're going to read a few verses for your hearing. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around him, about him, a great a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the priest. Now he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth and when his, when his eyes was opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither did he eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise. And go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judah for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayed. And has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here 
he has authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went in, went his way, and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou comest, that has, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight, forthwith and arose, and was baptized. Praise the Lord. Amen. We thank God. Amen for the reading of his word. We're going to use today, amen, for a subject. Amen. Go to the street. Call straight. Amen. Saul on the Damascus Road. Then Saul, we last saw Saul in Acts 3, 8 and 3, where it says that he made hectic of the church, havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Here he continued and expanded this work to the city in Damascus about 130 miles of Jerusalem, northeast of Jerusalem, a six days journey altogether, still breathing threats and murder against disciples of the Lord. The picture is of an angry, violent man absolutely convinced of his own righteousness. Saul hated the disciples of the Lord. He was a seeking Jesus when Saul south him he might say that Saul was decided against Jesus. But when Jesus decided for Saul, it might all, it made all the differences in the world. We don't know what Saul looked like. An old book dating to the end of the first century described Paul like this, a man of moderate stature. Amen. A man with a Chris hat. Crooked legs, blue eyes, large neck, brows, and long nose. At times, looking like a man. And at times, looking like an angel. That's what the old book says. He went to the high priest. Saul did his preaching work, uh, prosecuting work under the direct approval of the highest religious authority. He asked and received letters from the high priest authorizing his mission. You see, Saul thought that he was doing the will of God. Amen. Saul didn't know, amen, that he was fighting against God. Amen. But he will soon find out. The high priest mentioned here was Caiaphas. In December 1990, a bone box was discovered in Jerusalem. The ossuary was inscribed with the name on this uh, Caiaphas, and positively dated to this period. Inside was discovered some of the remains of a 60-year-old man whom many researchers believe was this same Calvus. Amen. If true, these are the first physical remains such as bones or ashes of a specific person mentioned in the New Testament. Still breathing threats and murder. Even after Saul became a Christian, he remembered his days as a prosecutor. In Philippians 3, he made mention of his background. Amen. Philippians 3, he talked about that thing. Amen. Saying he was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. A Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law. A Pharisee concerning zeal. Persecuting the church concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. In Galatians 1 and 13, Paul added more regarding his background. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God 
beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being exceedingly zealous for the tradition of my fathers, Saul of Tarsus, his, this highly educated man, thought those that Christians uh, was both wrong and deceptive. He found any who were of the way. Here, Christianity is referred to as the way. This seems to be the earliest name for the Christian movement, and a fitting one used five times in Acts. The name the way means that Christianity is more than a belief or a set of opinions or doctrines. Following Jesus is a way of life, as well as believing. It is significant to see that there was a Christian community large enough in Damascus for Paul to be concerned about. Christianity, the way, was spread in everywhere. Maybe Saul thought that he was trying to stop a plague of false religion. If there is no belief, there is no Christianity. Suddenly a light shone, shone from around him from heaven and heard a voice somewhere outside of Damascus. Amen. This certainly happened. God does not confront sinners with a heavenly light normally and an audible voice from heaven. Amen. In Acts 22 and 6, Paul revealed that this happened at midday when the sun shines at its brightest. Yet Paul said that this light was brighter than the sun. Acts 26 and 13, then he fell to the ground. Saul's reaction was simply to fall to the ground. This wasn't because of uh, uh, honor or uh, reference to God. It was simply a reaction of survival. He was terrified at the heavenly light. In the minds of many, of most people, Saul fell from a horse that he rode. Yet this account in Acts 9, not a telling in Acts 22, 3 and 11, nor the account of Acts 26, 12 through 20, makes any mention of a horse or Saul riding any kind of animal. It may be that he rode but the text does not specifically say so. Many persons suppose he was on horseback and painters, amen, thus represent him. But this is utterly without foundation in the scriptures. Paul heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul. When God repeats a name twice, it is to display the emotions but not necessarily anger, as in the Martha, Martha, or Luke 10, 41. Amen. And Jerusalem, and the Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and Matthew 23 and 37. Why are you persecuting me? As the heavenly light overwhelmed him, Saul was confronted by the true nature of his crime. He persecuted God, not man. Saul thought that he was serving God viciously attacking Christian, but he discovered that he was fighting against God. This has been sadly true through history. Oftentimes who we, uh, who are convinced they are doing God a favor do much of the worst persecution and torture ever practiced. People, we got to be careful how we treat one another. We shouldn't only emphasize the meat in the phrase, why are you persecuting me? We should also notice the why and see that Jesus asked, why are you persecuting me? That is Saul. Why are you doing such a fruitful thing? I am Jesus. Though Jesus was a fairly common name in that day, the ascended Jesus of Nazareth needed a fairly common name. It was a fairly common name. In that day, amen, the ascended Jesus of Nazareth needed no further identification. When he said, I am Jesus, Saul knew exactly which Jesus spoke. Amen. In all probability, Saul heard Jesus teach in Jerusalem, and as a likely member of the Sanhedrin, 
Saul sat in judgment of Jesus in the trial before his crucifixion. He appeared of Jesus, proved, his appearance of Jesus proved that Jesus was alive and that Jesus was God. Who are you, Lord? Lord, what do you want me to do? Saul responded, amen, with two of the most important questions anyone can ask and must ask. Who are you, Lord? We must ask this question with a humble heart, amen, and ask it to God. Jesus showed us exactly who God is, and he can answer this question. Paul spent the rest of his life wanting to know more completely the answer to this question. Philippians 3 and 10, hear Paul that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. What do you want me to do? Few dare to ask God this question. But when we ask it, we must ask it with submission and determined obedience. So a question was personal. He asked the question with a me, Lord, what do you want me to do? He often, uh, we often are quite interested with God when God wants others to do. But the surrender heart asks, Lord, what do you want me to do? It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. This was uh, an extremely sharp stick used to get an ox going the way you want when planned. One jab the hind legs of the ox, amen, with the prick until the ox cooperated, amen. And we know, amen, that in this case, Paul was the ox, amen. Jesus is portrayed as the form, amen, amen. And the pricking caused Saul some pain. Yet instead of submitting to Jesus, Saul kicked against the prick and only increased his pain. Amen. How many Christians do you know today, amen, of those that uh, don't know the Lord and the pardon of their sins that are kicking against the prick? Amen. In other words, you're fighting against God. Amen. God trying to get you to go, amen, the right way and you're constantly going the wrong way. Amen. And God is so good to us and so merciful. Amen. He hangs in there with us for a long time. Amen. And hopefully we'll get on the road that is called straight soon or later. This shows the great love of Jesus. He was the persecuted one. Yet his concern was for the effect it had on Saul. What a tender hearted Jesus. Yes, Jesus has a tender heart. Saul was three days without light, without sight, and neither ate nor drank. It seems that Saul was so shaken by the experience that he was unable to eat or drink for three days. All Saul could do was simply sit in a blind silence. This was a humbling experience, and a time when Saul must have challenged all his previous ideas about who God was and what pleased God. God told Ananias, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come in and, and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. The Lord sent Ananias to a street called Straight to see a man that was on the straight street. We all need to get on the straight street. Amen. The more we stay on the straight street, the more God going to raise us up in him. Ananias was an ordinary man, not an apostle, a prophet, a pastor, or evangelist, or an elder, or a deacon. Yet God used him because he was an ordinary man. And he was available. If an apostle or a permanent person, a man, ministered, had ministered to Saul, people might say, Saul, Paul, received his gospel from a man instead of Jesus. 
In the same way God needs to use this certain disciple, there is a special work for them to do. It wasn't absolutely necessary that God used a man like Ananias for this purpose. Uh, amen. And so is life being simply a certain disciple. Amen. We know that God is in control of all things. Amen. Amen. God simply used Ananias because God loves to use people. And Ananias was a willing servant. And that's all God needs is a willing vessel. God needs a vessel that is not too busy to hear his instruction. God needs a vessel that is obedient unto him. But Ananias heard the voice of God sweetly in a vision where God called and Ananias obediently responded to say, here I am, Lord, is a perfect response to God. We shouldn't be surprised if people like Saul received God's word with initial resistance. Amen. And questioning. Yet we should expect the disciple of Jesus to resist God's word. Amen. To receive God's word like Ananias did. In the case of Ananias, the vision from God was specific. God told him a Pacific street, a street called Straight, a Pacific house, the house of Judas, a Pacific man, one called Saul of Tarsus, a Pacific thing the man was doing. He is praying. A Pacific vision the man had. In a vision, he had seen a man named Ananias. This specifically was necessary and important because God asked Ananias to do something bold and dangerous in meeting Saul, the great prosecutor. Amen. He needed confirmation along the way that God was guiding him and God gave him ways to confirm this. God's instruction to Ananias was clear. God's instruction to us is clear. And it's all in the book. All we got to do is just pick up our Bible and we'll see the instruction that God has laid out for us. Amen, somebody. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I want eternal life. I have eternal life. Amen. And if anybody wants eternal life, amen, get in the book. Read the instructions from God. Amen. And he'll put us on the street that is called straight. Praise the Lord. And you won't have to wear it. Amen. About what people are saying or what people are doing because your mind is fixated on Christ. Amen. For Christ I live and for Christ I'm going to die. Now, praise the Lord. We thank God for that. Amen. God instructions. God told Ananias about Saul vision. He knew about it. Amen. God told uh, Ananias that Paul was praying. Amen. So Ananias really didn't have a whole lot, to, amen, to be afraid of. Uh, even though he knew the repetition of Paul, but, amen. But we find here that he still had a lot of encouraging uh, things to do what God say do because he believed in God and he knew that God had took care of him up until this point and God will continue to take care of him. I wonder how many out there know that God is taking care of you right now. I wonder how many know that they're not sure whether God is doing it or they're, they're doing it themselves. Amen. But if you're alive and well today, I want you to know it's all God doing. Amen. We can't do nothing of ourselves. Amen. But God is in control. Thank God he's in control. We have a just God that is in control. So we hear, amen, uh, uh, one might say that Saul had never really prayed before. He merely repeated former prayers before this. His prayer was more mechanical, mechanical than spiritual. Amen. He had never prayed with Jesus as mediator. He had never prayed in Jesus' name. He had never, not prayed with a humble heart near to God. Saul had said many prayers, but he had never truly prayed. Lord, I have heard from many about this man. Certainly Ananias had heard that this angry and violent persecutor named Saul of Tarsus was on his way from Jerusalem. 
the disciples in Damascus must have anxiously prepared for the coming persecution. I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done. Ananias' objections was perfectly logical and well-founded. However, they presumed that God needed instruction or at best counsel. Ananias almost asked God, do you know what kind of guy this is? In fact, Ananias knew a great deal about the mission of Paul, uh, Saul, amen, which was Paul. And let me explain that because Saul, amen, was uh, 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 Paul's Jewish name, amen. Paul was Saul, amen, uh, Roman name, amen. So we got that clear, amen, God. So if I say Paul or Saul, you'll know that I'm talking about the same person. And I just knew a great deal about the mission of Saul, amen. How much harm he had done to your saints in Jerusalem. He has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. It was apparently widely known. He is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name. God had a call upon the life of Saul. At this time, God had not yet revealed that calling to Saul. He seems to have told Ananias first. Praise the Lord. God considered Saul his chosen vessel. Long before there appeared anything worthy in Saul to choose, God knew what he would, could do, could make of Saul, even when Saul or Ananias didn't know. To bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, this describes in broad outline the calling and the future work of the broken, blind, afflicted man Ananias will soon meet. God called him to bring who he is and what he has done. My name to the Gentiles, to kings, and to the children of Israel. He will not blame Ananias for a measure of disbelief. Such a great big calling for such an unlikely man. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. This was a sobering addition to the great call God put upon the life of Saul. Saul will leave a life of privilege to embrace a high calling, but a call with such suffering, much suffering. Lord, I have heard from many about this man. Certainly, Ananias, a man, had heard that this angry and violent persecutor uh, named Saul uh, Tarsus was on his way from Jerusalem. Disciples in Damascus must have anxiously prepared for the coming persecution. I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done. Ananias objection needed instruction. Amen. Uh, Ananias objection was perfectly logical. Amen. And well faith, well founded. However, they presumed that God needed instruction or uh, at best counsel. Ananias almost asked. In fact, Ananias knew a great deal about the mission of Saul. Amen. And how much he had done. He is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name. God had a call upon the life of Saul. And at this time, God had not yet revealed that calling to Saul. Amen. God considered Saul his chosen vessel. Long before there appeared anything worthy and saw to choose. God knew what he would, could, could make of Saul. And when Saul or Ananias didn't know, praise the Lord, to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. This, this describes in broad outline the calling and the future work of the broken, blind, afflicted man Ananias will soon meet. God called him to bring who he is and what he has done. My name to the Gentiles, to kings, and to the children of Israel. He would not blame Ananias for a measure of disbelief. Amen. So Ananias went his way, entered the house, laying hands on him. He said, Brother Saul, this act of laying hands and the words, Brother Saul, powerfully Amen. Communicated the love of God. Blind Saul could not see 
that love on Ananias' face. So he communicated it through his touch, his voice. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. It seemed that this, when Paul was actually born again, here is where he received the Holy Spirit and was healed from his blindness, which was spiritually, was spiritual blindness as well as physical blindness. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Saul was now numbered among the disciples of Jesus and become, become, became and became friends with those he had previously tried to imprison or kill. This shows the, the remarkable radical nature of his transformation. When God steps in someone's life, it changes everything about that person. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. God wants all of us on the street called straight. And if you are not on the street called straight, you need to consider it. I'm sure Paul wouldn't take anything for his journey. Because he said, I learned whatsoever state I'm in, I learned to be content. Paul understood, amen, that he was not in control of his journey. So therefore, Paul was content with whatever state he found himself in. And I want you, my brothers and sisters, amen, we all need to be like Brother Paul. Be content because Amen. We are not in control, but we serve one that is in control. And if because he is in control, uh, amen, we can do the things that God will have for us to do. And we don't have to worry, amen, about uh, anything because God is going to take care of all of us. Amen. We know, amen, at this time that uh, they're still practicing distancing and Amen. With the corona out there. But I want you to know that God is in control of that too. There is nothing, amen, that is happening at any time that God is not in control of. I want to encourage your hearts today. Amen. Enjoy your safety. Amen. Don't worry about anything because God's going to take care of you. Now, amen. We believe that because we stand on that. Amen. We pray to him every day. Amen. We read about him every day. Amen. And he don't come up short. Amen. And I got a God that I serve that, that don't come up short. I don't need to come up short to him. Amen. I'm not going to let God down because of something that is going on in the world. No, I'm going to do what God say do. Amen. Because we all got a life to live. Amen. We got to be what God said that we are. Amen. We got to live upright. We got to talk upright. We got to be way the way God want us to be. And what I love about it, you ain't got to worry. God is always with you. Amen. Somebody, you don't have to go anywhere by yourself. They may not see nobody with you, but you better know for yourself that God is always with you. For the word said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you until the ends of the world. And I don't know about you, but that gives me great joy. That tells me if I stay on the track, if I stay on the street called straight, God's going to work it out. No matter what comes against me. I know that God is going to work it out and I'm trusting and believing and in God Almighty. I don't know about you, but I know that God lives and he lives in my heart. And I know there's others that is watching out there. You know for yourself that God is living through you. Ain't you glad that God chose you. Uh, he chose Saul. Uh, he chose you. Uh, and he wants you uh, to go and live uh, the way he said live. Be upright. Do what God said do. And God would never let you down. Get on the street that is called straight. Don't let nothing pull you off. 
Amen. But stay on that street. Amen. Be faithful to your church when we go back to come back together. Make sure, amen, that the pastor or the preachers see you every Sunday. Amen. Whenever the doors are open, be sure to be there. Amen. Because that's what God want us to do. He told us in his word, forsake not to assemble yourselves together as the man of some have. Amen. I believe God. Amen. I know that God got many things that he told us. Amen. That was a commandment from God. Amen. I know some people think it's only ten commandments, but God gave us a lot of commandments. He let us know, amen, that we got to obey his word. We got to stand in the gap for one another. We got to lift one another up to him. Amen, somebody. I feel pretty good because God has been good to me. And I want the world to know that for God I live and for God I'm going to die. We thank God. We thank God for his word. Amen. God's word is everlasting. Amen. And everything that we need, we find it to be in God's word. And I thank God. I thank God. Amen. For each of you at this time. Amen. Get your communion. Amen. Together. Get it in your hand. And we're going to go ahead and have our communion. Because this is the first Sunday on May. Amen. The first Sunday in May. Amen. And we certainly, amen, want to have our communion <coughs> with you. <coughs> and tonight, uh, before I get started, let us pray. Eternal and everlasting Father, we come once again to say thank you. We thank you, dear God, for blessing us to come and stand before your people once again. And Father, we ask that you continue to bless your people everywhere. We pray, Father, that you will continue to help us to live this life that is pleasing to you. We pray, Father God, that you will continue to smile on those that are sick in their bodies. We ask that you heal them in a mighty way. Touch today, God. Deliver today. Set free today, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray for every saint, God. We ask that you bless them miraculously. And let them know, God, that you wrap right them with them. In the name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for it. We praise you for it. And we honor you for it right now. And God, as we partake of this communion, we pray that you will bless us and help us to search ourselves that make sure that we're in the faith. For we don't want to eat and drink damnation to our own souls. So Lord, we ask that you uh, take this communion and change it from carnal into spiritual. And Lord, we'll forever give you the praise and the glory for that. If we have committed any sin, God, we ask that you forgive us of, of it right now. Before we partake of this communion, we pray, Father God, that you will help us to be everything that you will have for us to be. And Lord, we'll be so careful to give you the praise and the glory for that. And we praise your holy name right now. We ask you all these blessings. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. On the night that our Lord and Savior was portrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may eat. And likewise, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood of the New Testament, which was shed for many for the remission of sin. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. You may drink. Then he said, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine with you anymore until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And they stood 
amen, and sung a hymn and marched out. Amen. We thank God for you. Continue to pray for one another. Pray for me. And I'll continue to pray for you. Amen. Because we know that God is on the throne. Amen.